Isaiah this morning. Isaiah 63 is where we will take our text and um, as you're turning, we need to pray that the Lord might just meet with us this morning. And if that happens and his trail fills the temple as it did in the days of Isaiah, um, all will be well. Uh, Isaiah 63, beginning in the 8th verse. Isaiah 63 and verse 8. The Bible says, For he said, Surely thou art my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his present and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them, and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled, and they vexed the Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea, and the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within them? And he led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water from before them to make himself an everlasting name. And, they let, and led them through the deep as an horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused them to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Look down from heaven, and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength? The sounding of thy bowels and of the mercy toward me. Are they restrained? Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer, and thy name is from everlasting. Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you great glory and honor today for your goodness and watch care. God, we pray this morning that you would open your word to our hearts. Lord, the Bible says our hearts are hard from time to time, and we need our hearts softened up this morning that we might see you for who you are. God, we pray for the lost that meet with us every Sunday that don't know you. God, that you might manifest yourself to them. There's nothing more that we can do but preach the gospel, and you have the power to save. God, we pray that you would be with us as a people together. Cause us to glorify your name this morning. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning on our everlasting God. Now, everlasting is a very difficult thing for mankind to understand because we all have a beginning in our mind and we all have an end in our mind, but we don't really. Uh, uh, the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning was God. Now that beginning is for our benefit, not for God's benefit, because it says in the beginning, God. So he already was, he already is, he already always will be, but for our purposes, he gives us a starting point. So everlasting is a very hard concept for mankind to, to grasp and get a hold of. And I think many times that's why we struggle sometimes with redemption and salvation is that we don't even understand what, what forever is all about. And so he says from everlasting that this is the situation forever and ever and ever. And when I began to think about forever and ever and ever, I think of two, two things, two, two things that's going to happen. You'll be everlasting forever with God, or you'll be everlasting in hell. That's the only, that's the only two that's out there. We live in a day and age where people don't like that. They want a third option, or they want a God that's a God of love, but he has no righteousness and no holiness about him. And that is not the God of the Bible. 
So we need to really try to, con to con make a concept and get a hold of what everlasting is because whether you're in glory or you're in hell, you are an everlasting object. You're inward man. Your soul is everlasting to everlasting. And, and you know, with a commodity like that, with something the only enduring piece of mankind is his soul, then we need to take it very seriously, and we look at it, need to be very carefully what our soul is about, and more importantly than that, where our soul will be in eternity to come. So, as Isaiah begins to review some history of Israel, and even point to Christ with the same scriptures, uh, he wants us to understand the concept of everlasting. In verse 8, he begins where he said, Surely thou art my people. Now, uh, I personally believe if you, if you read the context and I understand it like I should, he's including us in that. Not just the Israelites, not just the, the children of Moses, but he, he's encompassing everybody in that. You're my people. You belong to me. I, 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 I'm your God. I, I am who I said I was to, to individuals that are his. He says that. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. Now, this is the thing. Every one of us say, well, that's not me because I've lied. And, and if we say we haven't lied, we lied in the state. Because every one of us have that nature. Every one of us is told a lie of some kind. And if you don't believe that, think about this, gentlemen. If your wife comes in and says, how's this dress look? And you know it's ugly. What are you going to say? That looks terrible. That, that I throw it in the trash. What are you going to say? And, and so every one of us have told lies. But this is what the scripture is concerning. Have you told yourself a spiritual lie? Mm. Have you told yourself everything's okay when you know full well it's not? Have you told yourself that things are all right between me and the Almighty? And you know full well that you're lost and away from Him and, and, have, no, and, and have no spiritual concept of things whatsoever. And, and, and I really believe that we, we lie in one or the other in a situation where we're telling a lie or we're telling at least the spiritual truth. For he said, surely are my people, excuse me, for he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie, so he was their savior. Now, in the was part, he's talking about preserving national Israel. In grace, he is your savior, or he's not. You don't believe that? Read 1 John chapter 3. And verse 8, and he tells of his eternity, eternal saving ability. And uh, we have a lot out there today that says, well, you can be saved and you can be lost. Well, this is my answer with, children, with people like that. They've never ever been redeemed to start with. Because, see, salvation is an enduring salvation. It will make you love the Lord Almighty all the rest of your life despite what qualities you may see fair or unfair. It will still endear him to you. And so we find then that, that he introduces and says, I was their savior. I was their preserver. I, I was the one that delivered them. Verse 9, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Now, uh, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and George, the Lord Jesus Christ understood our flesh. He understood how it was built and what it was built with. And he says, uh, in your affliction, I was afflicted. Now, one thing that's missing today in this modern gospel that's out there, what, what's missing in your little ABC except uh, except that you're a sinner. You know what? You get this. You don't take home anything else. You remember this. Whether you accept
accept you're a sinner or whether you're not, you're a sinner. You don't have to accept it. That is your nature. That is who you are. That, that is what we're about. We are sinners. And what's the next one? Believe. You know what? Whether you believe there's a God on the throne uh, or not this morning, there's a God on the throne. And the Bible says he doeth what seemeth good unto himself. Your next little C, confess that you're a sinner. You know, I don't care whether you can uh, confess it or not. You're a sinner. I am too. Uh, he, you know, and, and you know what the problem with all that ABC is? Every one of them has something to do with you and nothing to do with Christ. I accept, I believe, I confess. I, 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 I. And a salvation that's built on you will never amount to much. Right. And, and so we see then as the Lord Jesus Christ uh, says, listen, I understand who you are. I understand your affliction. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been afflicted over sin? Afflicted means that you're devastated. Afflicted means you're you're incapacitated. You're brought down. Now, when, when, when I was a kid, Mama had a cousin named Freddie. And all my life, I heard Freddie was afflicted. That's what they called it back then. They didn't call him handicapped or anything like that. Freddie was Mama's afflicted cousin. And let me tell you a little about, about Freddie. Freddie couldn't walk. He was afflicted that way. Freddie couldn't see. He was blind. He was afflicted that way. See, there are people that are spiritually afflicted that have never seen an enduring Christ. They're, they're blinded that way. And, and, and more serious than that, they've never really even seen themselves as sinners. They're blinded to it. They think they're okay. They think, well, I'm a child. They, they think all this other stuff when really they are blinded. They, they've never been open to the goodness of God. They've never been made to see what, what they're really about. And, and so we see then we're dealing with an affliction. We're dealing with a problem in the flesh and that's sin. Notice what else. He, he, uh, in all their afflictions he was afflicted. The angel of his presence Saved them. So how are you saved? The presence of the Almighty. I want you to see never in your Bible will you get the Romans road or will you get the ABC or will you get the one, two, three. The Bible just says here, he was with them and that's enough. You know when you'll get saved? When you, like Lydia, when your heart's open, that's when you'll be saved. And you'll never even understand you're a sinner without the Lord God opening your heart to it. And, and so we find that that is their situation. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity. See, it wasn't nothing you did that granted salvation. It was just his love for you and he, you were pitiful in his sight and he saved you. See, that's not popular preaching today, is it? Because you know what? It leaves you helpless, don't it? Yeah. Makes you feel like, hey, then, then what can I do? Well, there's nothing you can do. But there's something God can do. See, Jesus, prayed a, Jesus paid a propitiation for you, or a cost, a propitiation. Uh, and that cost was his life. Yeah. That was shedding out his life's blood on, on behalf of us as sinners. And, and, and so we find here that, that the Lord God Almighty makes it very clear through the words of Isaiah that listen, it was nothing that he did, that they did. He redeemed them, not the other way around. They didn't redeem themselves. They didn't ask to be redeemed. They didn't invite the redeemer into their heart. He did it because of his goodness and his mercy. He re 
<laughs> he redeemed them and bare them. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful verse. Man. You know why? <laughs> you know why? I'm still saved today. It ain't how good I've been. It ain't because I'm a preacher. It's because he bore me. Yeah. He bears me. I make mistakes every day. Let him down. Uh, sometimes probably in my actions at least deny his holy name. But he bears me. You know when you bear somebody... You, you, you scoop them up. And Donna gets mad. I don't think I could do it now. And Joey's got a little chunky like me. But used to when Joey fell down, I'd just scoop him up and carry him to his bed. And uh, I was burying him on my arms. See, that's what he does for you. Isn't it a wonderful thing this morning that he bears us? He carries us. He, we, we don't have to worry about eternity because he bears us in himself. And, and that's what we as the Lord's people need to understand. This is how good he's been to us. And he carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled. Uh, now listen, he gave us a new spiritual nature, but we have the same old flesh to deal with. We rebel daily. You know, if, if you don't believe that, just a look around you. Uh, have you ever noticed it's your nature almost in the flesh, I'm speaking, to do exactly the opposite of what God would have you to do? Yeah. It really is. That, that's our nature. If he writes it down left, we would prefer right. That's our nature, right? Women's length of a hair. Hairs to be long. Right now, some have them shorter than me. Oh, yeah. And uh, flip side's the same. You know what? Separate part about the grace of God, I would think my hair looked pretty good when it was down to here. Uh, kind of like Sarah's. But see, you know, that's just rebellion, right? We, you know, this is coming down to this. We don't even know what's good for ourselves. Yeah. We, we really, really don't. So in that, in that nature, rebellion comes up and we go against the things of God in every way, in everything that we do. You know why people that are redeemed sometimes don't go to church? It's rebellion. You know why people don't like to dress right? It's rebellion. That's all it is. And so we find then that's our nature. That's what we have to deal with. But they rebelled, and notice this is the danger, and vexed his Holy Spirit. You ever think about what your rebellion is doing to the other members of New Testament church? Well, if you're in rebellion, you're vexing the Holy Spirit, and when you vex the Holy Spirit, he don't show Vexing means to push away. Vexing means to incapacitate. Vexing means to stop. And sometimes we do that, don't we? They vexed his Holy Spirit. See, you know uh, why the Holy Spirit is so minimized in many of the Lord's churches? I used to think it was because they'd be identified with the Pentecostals. I don't believe, I, I don't believe that anymore. The reason they don't speak much of him is because they vex him. So he doesn't bother them. He don't trouble them. You, you, know, you know what has to be necessary for redemption is to be convinced of your sin. And you know how you're convinced of your sin? The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. That's all that will ever happen. That, that's the only means it will ever come our way is in that situation. And so we find then that it is the, uh, it is the situation of God's man, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, they turned to be, therefore he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. To me, that means that the, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is, is just important as and just as an important part of 
the deity of God as anything else because when he was vexed, he said, okay, I'm against you now. I'm going to fight against you because you know what? You, you had a problem. You, you did a vexation on one member of the Godhead so all three of them would be mad at you now. And so that was the vexation that they, they suffered. He said, I'm turning on you. Uh, you would not listen. You would not obey. So now you are a vexation. And now you are our enemy. Very short temper. That's one thing that's holy and wonderful about God. His temper is temper, his not long. Then he remembered the days of old. Don't you love to look back on the day that the Lord saved your soul? I love to remember that. Because, see, I think at that point I was as near to God, as close to God as I've ever been. And I love to remember that. I remember walking up that road. We didn't own a car. It's not very far from the Free Will Church there in Carlisle up to the little house where we lived in. The house is not there now. And uh, I felt light as air walking up there. Couldn't wait to tell Mother how good God had been to me. Did I understand all the truths about that word? No. All I knew was I was saved. All I knew that if my nature had been changed forevermore. And you know what? That's all at that point. That's all I needed to know. That's all, all, you know, that's all I was convinced of at that time was that God had saved my never dying soul. And, and, and what else did I need? What else was, was necessary? And, and I love to remember those things. I love to look back on the goodness of God. Then he remembered the days of old. Moses and his people. You ever thought about people who have been spiritual figures in your life? I look back, I mentioned both. Oh, Brother B.R. Sanford, you know what? Probably wouldn't have been much we could have agreed on in the, number, in the modern day, but I remember him hanging up the, that old hymn book of his prosthesis and talking about the goodness of God and where God had brought him from. I th you know, that impacted me the rest of my life. And I like to remember the days of old, don't you? And you know, the sad point is, a lot of time now we have to focus more on history than present because, listen, we're not doing much. You, you, know, you know what would make things like that happen again is a willing heart among God's people. Just a willing heart. You know what? VR couldn't sing that well, but man, he knew how to praise the Lord. And uh, so we see then a lot of times our willingness is the problem. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, where is he that brought us up out of the sea? Where is the shepherd of his flock? Now you think about walking across the Red Sea on dry ground. You know, you've seen your little, was it or, uh, that movie, The Ten Commandments? And I, I don't like that movie much because they're in about ankle deep water. It was sloshing through it. Man, they was kicking up dust. And they was on their way to glory. Ever thought about how wide it must have been? Your little, your little film, it's about as wide as this, this aisle here between the churches. Listen, <laughs> they had to get four and a half million people through there. I bet it was as wide, I bet it was a mile wide or wide just to get the people across safely. You ever thought about the walls of water standing on the side? Had the opportunity to look on there, you might have seen a whale going by or a shark looking at you and just still kicking up dust on your way in. Can you imagine that? Could you imagine being one of those to actually remember it? That's why I want my children and my grandchildren to know, hey, back when I was a kid, people weren't ashamed. They wept over sin. They cried out to God. They testified, hey, God has brought me safe this far. And you don't see that anymore. So I want them to remember. You know, uh, when they had made it cross, after they got on the other side of the Red Sea, God said, get you 12 stones, one for each tribe. Yeah. And set you up a little, a little altar there. And they said, why? 
He said, when your children ask what meaneth these stones, you could tell them. <laughs> you, you, you could say that's where he brought us across the Red Sea. And, and, and so we see then as the Lord's people that, that we need to look on what God's done for us in the past and be excited and glad about it. At the end of verse 11, where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Now, I want you to see God is the factor in all that. He put his Holy Spirit within him, meaning the individual, meaning Moses, really. And he puts it in us today. That led them by the right hand of Moses from his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. That led them to the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. Now, in verse 13, he begins to speak of leading them through the wilderness. Now, you're in the wilderness now. And you're going to run into briar patches. You're going to run into streams and lakes along the way. You're going to run into places that are difficult for you. And all I can tell is just keep going. Y'all remember a few years ago, and I've been the first mission conference second, uh, we got lost down here in the wood, in the log woods, almost at Highway 18. My, my Air Force veteran got us lost, right? And uh, we came down one hollow, and you could see the cars, and you could hear the road, but you couldn't get to it. There's so many briars and so thick. And we was trying to get, and I guess Justin was maybe, what, 15 at the time? Had some smaller than him. We couldn't get to the kids to where they needed to be. So you know what we had to do? We had to get out and go back around. See, there's going to be obstacles on the way. The only thing I can tell you is go around them. Just be sure when you get to the other side, you're still headed in the right direction. See, there, there, there's going to be difficulties along the way. This health and wealth teaching is not biblical. It is not what the Bible teaches. He promised us a wilderness, a difficult place, and wanted us to continue even in that. Verse 14. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of God calls him to rest, so didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Look down from heaven, and behold from the habitation of thy holiness, and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and, and thy strength? You see, you see what Isaiah was desiring to see? He was desiring, he wanted an example of God's holiness. You know why God don't show up many, many times? Is we've stifled not the Holy Spirit. You can't do that. That's part of God. But we can stifle His holiness. We bring so many worldly thoughts and worldly actions into this, into this congregation that He's not going to put His holiness upon us. Yeah. He, he, he's not going to manifest Himself in that way. Why? Because we don't deserve it. Because we're not serving Him. Because we're not near unto Him. That is why. Take on the personal responsibility. Where is thy zeal? I'm not asking that of God. I know where his is. Where's yours? Where is thy zeal? Your desire. Your push to serve God. You know what? People oughtn't have to be browbeated to church. If they do, they lack zeal. People oughtn't have to be browbeated to hand out tracts. If you do, they lack zeal. They, they have no, no self-push, no self-glee, no self-happiness in serving God. Because if they did, you wouldn't have to push them. Where is thy zeal and thy strength and the sounding of bowels of thy mercy toward me? 
Are they restrained? No. There's nothing today about God that is restrained than ever he has been. Verse 17 is Isaiah is asking, where is your zeal? Where is your holiness? Are they restrained? No. Why don't we see modern day revival? Is God restrained? Can he not give it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I am the Lord. I change not, right? So the same giver of revival in Isaiah's day, in Jesus' day, and in Paul's day is the same of giver revival today. We just, we just need to desire it. We, we need to be a holy people so that we might, that we might embrace it and, and, and might, and, and might uh, receive it like we should. Verse 16. Doubtless thou art our, fa our Father. Now I want you to ask yourself, can you really say that? Now, two of three of three, two of my children, natural children are here. I'm your father. You can look at Sarah and say, doubtless. Matthew, I mean Adam may be a little bit more difficult to claim. You know why everybody understands that me and Sarah are related? We look alike. Yeah. Brown eyes, dark brown hair, olive colored skin. You look alike. So, is he your father? Is Christ your father? I can't answer that for you. That's why he explained the gospel to religious Nicodemus like this. You must be born again. You don't look like me. You don't act like me. You don't present yourself. As Christian, am I your father? It's very important that you ask yourself, not just once, but numerous times, this side of glory. Am, is he your father? Do you really know him? You say, well, I don't like the question. Well, you don't know much about the Bible. Because the Bible says make your calling and election sure. Yeah. James knew what he was talking about, didn't he? And so we find then that as the Lord's people, <laughs> we need to know that. We need to know that, that he is our father, that we've been born again, that he is our redeemer. Doubtless thou art our father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and that's why I think he's talking about the Gentile age, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Our Redeemer. You know, to redeem something, a price has to be paid for it. And ownership has to be established. Y'all remember, those, those of you that are old enough, probably less than half of you, but remember taking Coke bottles to get them redeemed? And you hope you find enough on the edge of the road to get your own self a Coke when you get there? You used to uh, get a nickel or maybe a dime for them. And uh, see, they already belonged to the Coke company, didn't they? They just had to be redeemed. You just had to take them back in. And man, we dig them out of being nasty down in the ditch. And, and old Jim Armstrong would make us, make us clean them up. He wouldn't take them dirty. And uh, you'd have to clean them up to take them in there to him. And take two or three in there, and he'd give you a quarter. And immediately you'd go spend it, right? <laughs> but uh, it's who, the question was not the price of the bottle. It was who that it belonged to. And we belong to him. They, they, we belong to him. If, you be, if you're his, you belong to him. Now, I'll give you another example. Y'all remember an old double cola came out? Some nasty stuff. Ever put my mouth in worse than that is tap. <laughs> and um, uh, 
But double coal, y'all remember the bottles couldn't be redeemed. Y'all remember that? They were trash. If you tried to slip a double cola by Jim Armstrong, he'd give you a look that could kill. Uh, they weren't worth anything. Isn't that a shame? See, God knows the difference. He's placed value on you. You're not a double cola. Right? You have real intrinsic value. Your soul, your soul is so important. Only thing, make, make your calling and election sure. Do you know the Redeemer? Have you genuinely been saved? You say, Brother Larry, I just don't know. Well, how do you act? What do you desire? What are your interests? Do they center around the person of Christ? We need to know that, don't we? We need to ask ourselves that.